Good evening, everyone. I'm Jordan Spivey, joined by my dad. Travis Spivey. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm very excited today because we celebrated my son's 15th birthday yesterday. And I just remember when he was like a small, tiny baby, but now he's gotten so tall and he has all this great, amazing, cool hair. And his dad has... Well, let's go ahead and jump into our video for today. And what's that, Jay? Ideas that shape Darren's theory of evolution 101. So let's do this. Now let's talk about the important ideas that shape Darwin's theory of evolution. So first, we have an ancient changing Earth made by Hutton and Lyell. Second, we have Lamar's evolutionary hypothesis. Third, we have population growth made by Thomas Malthus. And then fourth, we have artificial selection, which includes plants and animals. Now let's take a look at the contributions of James Hutton and Charles Lyell. And first, we'll start off with James Hutton. And through his many geological studies, James Hudson came to the conclusion that the Earth must be much older than what people originally thought it to be. He used his knowledge of how geological processes form mountains, valleys, and layers of rock over many, many years to determine that the Earth is billions of years old. So if we take a look at this picture right here, this picture is actually showing a river canyon. And a river canyon is formed over many, many years. If you notice, look at this river at the very bottom of this canyon. But if you look on the side, look, take a look at the rocks. And the way these rocks were shaped and formed was through many years of rainwater, rainwater weathering and eroding at these rocks, which shaped this river canyon. Let's move over to Charles Lyell's principles of geology. And Lyell summarized that the laws of nature remain the same over time, and that scientists can explain past events according to processes they can observe in the present. So basically what Charles Lyell was saying is that these processes don't change, they just occur and repeat in a cycle over and over again over time. So if you take a look right here, Here's our weathering right here, and here's transportation, deposition, lithification, and then uplift and exposure. This process occurs again and again over many, many years, and that's how we're able to explain how this river canyon was formed in the past by just looking at the processes that are current occurring in the present. Remember, these processes don't change. They just repeat in a cycle over many, many years. Now let's take a look at Lamarck's theory of evolution, which ultimately proved to be inaccurate. Lamarck still had some very interesting ideas when it came to the theory of evolution. So first, Lamarck believed that all organisms had a tendency towards perfection. He said all organisms have an internal desire to become more complex in order to achieve perfection. They continually change in order to better survive in their environment. So for example, fish became, in his mind, fish became great swimmers in order to A, escape predators, and B, to, in order to capture prey. So over many, many years, fish want to achieve this perfection and become great swimmers so they can better survive and adapt to that environment. And then he also had the idea in his theory of evolution of use and disuse, which is evolution occurs because some structures are used more so they become more developed over time while some structures are used less, so they become less developed over time. So for example, a giraffe's neck, and we'll be talking about that a little later in this video. And then thirdly, he believed that inheritance of acquired traits were characteristics that were acquired throughout an organism's lifetime and were passed on to their offspring. So for example, if a bodybuilder gains large muscles through consistent exercise, he'll be able to pass this acquired trait on to his offspring, which we all know that is not true. Let's take a look at Lamarckism versus Darwinism theory of evolution. And as we discussed on the previous slide, Lamarck believed that giraffes' necks became longer because they had to constantly stretch their necks to get food through use and disuse. So we take a look, Lamarck literally believed that a giraffe throughout the, its lifetime could make its neck longer by having to constantly stretch to get food. And so he believed that by the time a giraffe got much older, its neck became longer why? Because he had to constantly stretch his neck out over many years to get that food. And we know that this concept or this theory of evolution ultimately proved to be wrong. Now let's take a look at Darwin's theory of evolution. 
And Darwin believed that giraffes with longer necks were more suited to get food, and the giraffes with shorter necks died off. And this is through the process of natural selection. So let's take a look at this. If you notice, these giraffes on the first picture are able to reach the food and therefore have a much higher likelihood of surviving and passing their genes and genetics on to the next generation. But if you notice that these giraffes with their shorter necks have a much lower chance of surviving and will die off and will not be able to pass the genetics and genes on to the next generation. And if you look at this second generation right here, notice that you have more giraffes with longer necks in this generation. Once again, they're better suited to actually reach and get the food, which will help them to, to survive. And if you notice, once again, this giraffe with this shorter neck has a much harder chance to get the food. So the giraffes with the longer necks are going to be able to pass on their genes and genetics on to the offspring or to the next generation. And this giraffe with this shorter neck will not be able to do so. So by the time we get to this third generation, all of these giraffes have long necks. Why? Because long necks are a better adaptation in order for giraffes to survive. And that's where we get the process or get the idea of survival of the fittest. The ones that are most fit to actually adapt and survive in the environment will live and the ones that are not most fit will die off. Now let's do a final overview of Lamarckism versus Darwinism. So first, use and disuse was Lamarck's belief that organs or parts of your body that you use more will get better while parts of your body that you did not use as much will get smaller and eventually fade away and then he also believed in the transmission of acquired characteristics and like we stated earlier he believed that if a person was a bodybuilder that they would actually literally be able to pass on this bodybuilding trait on to their offspring and then Lamarck also believed in increasing complexity because he believed that all organisms are working to achieve perfection or pushing towards perfection. And then Lamarck also believed that there was no such thing as extinction because all organisms want to constantly push towards perfection. So now let's take a look at Darwin's theory of evolution, which Darwin believed in genetic variation. And if we look at the human population, for example, notice that there's a large variety or vast amount of genetic variation within our population. So that's why we have so many different people that look so many different ways. And Darwin believed that the more genetic variation a species has, the better off or the better chances for survival that it will have. And then Darwin also believed in genetic inheritance. And this basically means that we inherit the traits that we have from our parents and our grandparents. So they're passed on or passed down from generation to generation. And then Darwin also believed in differential survival. And this goes back to survival of the fittest or natural selection. So the organisms that are best suited for their environment or best suited to adapt in their environment will survive and pass on their genetic, genetics or genes onto their offspring. And then Darwin also believed in extinction. So if an organism is not able to survive and adapt to an certain environment, then it will become extinct. In 1798, English economist Thomas Malthus stated that humans were being born faster than people were dying, which is leading to overpopulation. He went on to theorize that if the human population grew unchecked, then there would not be enough food and resources to sustain everyone on Earth. This led Darwin to the idea that natural selection would be the survival of the fittest, because there was not enough resources for every organism to survive. And so and therefore he said there would be a mate Malthusian catastrophe. And let's take a look at where this catastrophe would start from. If you notice, throughout time, our food supply has steadily risen at a constant rate. But if you notice, look at the human population right here. The human population begins to grow exponentially. And if you notice, at this point right here, the population is much greater or larger than the available food supply. And when this happens or when this occurs, Thomas Malthus believed that people would actually, there would actually be war, famine, and disease as a result of people competing for the little or the few remaining resources that are left. Now let's look at inherited variation through artificial selection. And Darwin further shaped his theory of evolution through the information he gathered from plant and animal breeders. 
They told him that some of the better traits of plants and animals could be selectively passed on from parents to offspring to improve crops and livestock. So let's take a look at this conventional method. And if you notice, in the conventional method, they crossed a virus-resistant plant with a high-yield crop. And through this process of crossing these two types of plants, notice that they was able to get a virus-resistant and high-yield crop. And this is how it's been done for many, many centuries. But if you notice, if with today's technology, we can now use genetic modification. And with genetic modification, we're actually able to take the genes or the genetic code or DNA from one plant and actually cross it with the genetic code and DNA from another plant. So look at this virus resistant plant's DNA being crossed with this high yield crops DNA. And if you notice, this DNA strand right here is a combination of both of these plants DNA. And what we end up getting, virus resistant and high yield crops. Now let's take a look at genetic modification with animals. So just how big are today's chickens? So let's take a look at the average weight of chicken breeds at 56 days old. And if you look, if you notice in 1957, at 56 days, the average chicken was 905 grams. But in 1978, that number doubled to 1,808 grams. But then if you look in 2005, that number is almost five times greater at 4,202 grams. And the size of these chickens were actually able to get larger through the process of genetic modification in a much shorter period of time. Now it is time for your check for understanding. You may use your notes in the knowledge you have gained from watching this video to answer the following questions. I'm Jordan Spivey, joined by my dad. Chavis Spivey. And ladies and gentlemen, make sure you have a wonderful, awesome, positive day. Peace. Peace.